All right, I don't think I'll use this in Sunday school. Do you think I need to? Well, I can. I can. Um, yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm going to take my jacket off, put it back on. But we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1, and while I'm trying to get this mic situated, uh, Fred is here. We're glad to see him. Um, the storms in the southeast, there's actually 44 people that have lost their lives from those storms. Uh, so we want to be in prayer for them. Kira has been able to contact her parents, but I believe she said she had not yet contacted her uh, grandparents and great-grandparents to see that they're okay. My mother in East Tennessee is okay, but there is quite a bit of flooding in their area. Uh, it hasn't affected them personally, which is uh, obviously a blessing to me. Um, and then Philip Wayne Sibley. All right, am I? Let's move. Let's move that over. Oh, you need to turn that down, bro. I mean, I'm whispering in this loud. Um, anyway, Phil Sibley, I thought, would be at men's prayer yesterday, and he wasn't. And uh, when I finally got in touch with him, his blood pressure was really low, which is not typically a problem he has. I want to say it was 90 over 50 or something along those lines. Anyway, before the end of the day, it got back up to uh, a reasonable, but still low for him. It was like 109 over 70 or something. And uh, he contacted me pretty early this morning that said he hadn't checked his blood pressure today, but that he uh, was still feeling pretty crummy. And so even though he would miss us, he wouldn't be here today. So we want to pray for him. Uh, I have a, a ministry acquaintance who is going to be in Croatia for the next uh, six or seven days uh, ministering to um, believers there. I promised him we would pray for him. Um, what am I leaving out? We got uh, Sham is still a little sick. We still have several people traveling, but am I am I leaving out anything major there? Okay, all right. Well, let's have a word of prayer then. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all that gathered out here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would uh, have your will not only here in the Sunday school, but also in the 11 o'clock, Lord. I pray that your people would go away encouraged. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just fill the auditorium, Lord, uh, with uh, different uh, visits and invites that uh, are being made by myself and by other members. I pray that you just have your will there, Lord. We do pray for our country, Lord. It's in a mess and uh, all sorts of conspiracy theories going around about what's going to happen between now and uh, November uh, voting and what would happen between then and January, Lord, and if we were to dwell on those things, Lord, we would absolutely go insane. So we help ask you to help us keep our minds on the unchanging Christ and his word. We put our country, our church, our families in your hands, Lord, asking you to do what's best, trusting you to do what's best, Lord. Thankful for the truth that nothing has ever occurred to you this is no surprise to you. You gave us a plan forward. Stay faithful to the word. Lord, we do pray for Phil, who's homesick. Uh, we pray that you would touch and heal him. Uh, Lord, uh, Chamberlain, who's also homesick, we pray that you'd continue to touch and heal her. Lord, the um, people affected by the storm from it uh, seems like mostly Georgia and the Carolinas and some in East Tennessee, Lord. We pray that you just uh, uh, obviously protect people there, Lord. But more importantly than that, I pray that you would use this natural disaster, we might say, to turn the hearts of the people in those areas back to thee, Lord. I pray that you use this craziness going on in our country 
to turn our hearts back to thee, Lord. We do pray for Mike in his situation. We thank you that we got to see him yesterday, and that was encouraging. Uh, we pray that you'd continue to work there, Lord. We love you. We pray all these things in Christ's name and for his honor alone. Amen. So in the last days, which is clearly, I've been going through that in the devotions in the morning. Uh, I'm going to bite off something in Sunday school. I think the, the, the video that we watched, you know, that's not a, a usual thing, I think, to do in Sunday school. But I think it, it gave us some great lessons in that a little slip here, a little slip there, a little compromise here or there can really lead to uh, greater changes than we might ever uh, think. I, I believe if you were to be able to ask uh, the Christians of the 1950s if they thought what they were doing would bring us to the 1960s and 1970s, I think the answer would be a resounding no. And yet we see time and again, we see it in Scripture, we see it in history, how time and again uh, people are thoroughly right with God and then they get complacent and they begin to back away from God. And then God gets their attention and uh, the faithful turn back to him and in, in wrath he remembers mercy and revives a people. Um, at the same time, you know, every generation uh, since the days of the apostles thought that Christ would return in their life, okay, uh, in their lifetime. And uh, they didn't think things could get any, any worse. Uh, um, we know that uh, the apostle John, I, if you look in your, we're going to start with Revelations today. I will not be able to cover a chapter a week in Revelation. It's just too deep. We're going to start with Revelation today. And I want you to look first at the title that the book is given. And I'm going to tell you that, that I don't think that that is a proper title. As I look at the top of the page of chapter 1 in my Bible, it says the Revelation of St. John the Divine. Now, <clears throat> As we read the first chapter, you will see that's not an accurate title. Man put that title there. Uh, the, what, what does the word revelation itself mean? You, you find that, just so you know, I'm going to read it in a second, but you find it's the second word of the verse, uh, first, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so uh, there are two reasons why I think those first few words of the chapter would be the better moniker or title for the book. Uh, first off, uh, if you read it, Jesus Christ is revealing himself and his plan to John. So we could say that it's, you know, they said it's the revelation of John because he wrote it down. But yet... Christ is actually the revealer, and Christ is revealing himself and his plan. Uh, so I think that that, that would be a, a, better, a better title, if you will. But, I mean, the book of Revelation is, is deep water. And I, I, I'll be honest, this is the first time I've ever tried to, to teach through it. Two reasons. Uh, my dad was a very wise man. Um, he preached through it on Wednesday nights when I was a boy. There are 22 chapters in Revelation. So you would think the way I preached, that would be 22 weeks. How many weeks are there in a year, Fred? 52. 52 and 52 is 104 and half of 52 is 26, so 130 sermons. And my dad said when he finished, I've just scratched the surface of the book. It's a deep book. We're going to try to, we're going to, try to cover a little bit uh, each week and go through it. And I think it will help us because we need to be prepared. As with every generation from John till now, Everybody believes Christ will come back in their day. Um, and we can tell 
silly stories about that. I know some preachers who are my mother's age and they were in Bible college in the 60s and, and uh, they laughed about the fact that they, they all went out and bought their wives new appliances when they were in Bible college because they were absolutely sure Christ would come back before they'd have to pay them off. Okay, and so I mean, everybody thinks that Christ is coming back in their day, and I I, I pray the same words that Joe prays. Anybody know how Joe how Joe how does Joe say goodbye? Don't you be quiet. Somebody else in the church, tell me. He says three words every time he says goodbye. What does he say? Maranatha. Goodbye, Maranatha. That's what he said. All right, Maranatha is basically. A word that means, come on back today, okay? So Joe, every time Joe says goodbye, he says, maybe today, maybe today, maybe today. And so we need to live our lives that way. And I think if we're going to live our lives that way, um, we need to be aware of what the scripture has to say. So even though it is a daunting task to go through Revelation, we're going to do our best to... to uh, to go through it. Um, when we look at the, the Old Testament, we get back to the New Testament in a second. If we look at the Old Testament, uh, we can describe the Old Testament. Hey, Julian, uh, 5, 12, you should be sleeping, man. Uh, 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. What does that mean? Denise, tell him what that means. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. I'm afraid I was giving a song in my head about perhaps today. <laughs> Well, amen. Well, 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. There are five books of the law, 12 books of history, five books of poetry, five books of major prophets, and 12 minor prophets. When we look at the New Testament, how does it break up? Well, we have the Gospels. Okay? There's four Gospel recordings. Uh, there's one Gospel. The Gospel is Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scripture, and he was seen. It's not a fairy tale. But we have the Gospel from the perspective that God gave Matthew, which has more Old Testament quotations in it than any other book. It is definitely written to the Jewish mindset. We see uh, Christ as the, the son of David. We see him as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of Israel, etc. Mark is written to the Roman or the Western mind. It's the big picture. No gene the genealogy in Matthew goes back to Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Y'all all know this, right? And in Matt and Mark, there's no genealogy. There's nothing about the birth. There's nothing that starts with the baptism of Jesus Christ, all right? It's the big picture. Don't bore me with the details. The the most repeated words in the book of Mark are and the other one is straight way. In other words, it's a book of action. He did this and he did this and he went there and he did there and immediately he, straight way means immediately. Immediately he did this. Immediately he went there. Okay, it's a book of action. Uh, it's a big picture. We see Christ as the sacrificial servant there in Mark. In uh, Luke, uh, Luke is the, I know there's fewer chapters than Matthew, but it's actually the longest gospel. Uh, people who don't believe the Bible read the book of Luke because it uh, is very well written, all right? Um, and we see Christ as the sinless son of man there in Luke. So there's a genealogy in Luke, uh, and it goes all the way back to Adam, okay? In fact, uh, it, it starts with Mary and Joseph and goes back to Adam, Whereas the one in Matthew starts with Abraham and comes forward to Christ. But uh, when we look at John, those three we call the synoptic gospels. They give us a synopsis of uh, Christ's life on earth. John is called the hortatory or the encouraging gospel. His um, purpose we find in John chapter 20 um, uh, Many other things did Jesus that are not written in this book, but these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have salvation in his name, okay? So uh, that is the Gospels. And then we have Acts, and Acts is what we call a, a transition book, okay? We don't build doctrine from Acts. We look at Acts as a, as a history book, um, and things are changing. We're moving from uh, the, uh, in the process, I guess officially the New Testament age began with the resurrection, but we're still changing there. The, the word, uh, the epistles have not been written yet and so forth. 
And it's if you look at uh, if you look at the title of Acts, like we looked at the title of Revelation, it says the Acts of the Apostles. I think it would be better stated the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so I'm, I'm, all this is introduction. I promise we're going to get to some of Revelation chapter one today. But Acts would be like the tree trunk. And the, the Gospels would be like the roots. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke would be the roots that spread out. And most trees have a tap root that goes deep. And that would be the Gospel of John. Because John actually starts before creation. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, uh, God, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, right? John says, uh, John starts out, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and with that him was not anything made that was made so before creation creation is in verse 2 and 3 but Jesus was already there okay that's the tap root and then the axe would be like the tree trunk and on the tree trunk we have the epistles now you tell me I've been doing a lot of talking you tell me how do we divide up the epistles tell me a group of epistles the prison epistles. And why do we call them the prison epistles? Um, Paul, wrote from Paul wrote them from prison. We have the prison epistles. We have the pastoral epistles, which Paul is writing to the young pastors that he's trained. First and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. These are the pastoral epistles. Uh, some of those were written also from prison. Second Timothy is written right before he had his head chopped off. All right. Um, Philippians is written from prison. But we have uh, epistles that teach us ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church. We have uh, that would be Ephesians. We have all these different epistles. And then we have uh, Hebrews, which again is an epistle. What does the word epistle mean, Danny? just a letter that's exactly right so all these letters are addressed to the church at rome uh, the church at corinth the church at corinth uh, <clears throat> the church at galatia the church in ephesus the church uh, in philippian in philippi uh, the church in which is in macedonia the church at Colossae. Uh, then we have two books written to the church at Thessalonica, then we have the pastoral epistles, and then we have Hebrews, which is kind of written to Jewish believers at large, and then we have James, which is a very practical book, once again, written to Jewish believers at large, and then we have First and Second and Third John, uh, and then I believe those are written to at least second and third John are written to particular churches, but I wouldn't like fight you if you didn't see it that way. First second Peter, first second third John, first second Peter's written to Jews that are dispersed, if you will. And then we come to Jude and then Revelation. Revelation is primarily what sort of book? It is a book of prophecy, which could be termed a book of the future. Anybody know who Josh Billings was? Anybody know who Josh Billings was? He's not a theologian or a pastor or anything. Um, he was born Henry Wheeler Shaw. But much like Samuel Clemens, he's known by his pen name, Josh Billings. Josh Billings says, said, never write prophecy. And he gave two reasons why to never write prophecy. You want to take a hazard a guess? He said, if you get it wrong, nobody will ever let you forget it. If you get it right, nobody will ever remember it. Now, obviously, he said that tongue-in-cheek. But I got to admit, I've never studied, other than listening to someone else, I've never studied through the book of Revelation for myself. It is, a, it's, it's deep water, all right? Um, prophecies come and go. You know, there are 700, I think, prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Christ. And yet, this book that John wrote, you know, roughly 1,900 years ago, a little better than that, uh, it's still with us. Remember the first time, anybody remember the first time you read through it? 
Has anybody read all the way through the book of Revelation? I mean, it's, it's some crazy stuff. And then you look at what lost people say about the book, about the Bible. What, what do lost people say about the Bible? It's crazy. And of course, we're offended at that, right? But if you don't know, what, what, what does the Bible say about the Bible? Somebody tell me something the Bible says about the Bible. It is forever settled in heaven. That's very important. Tell me something else the Bible says about the Bible. It's the word of God. What did you say? It's inspired, which means God breathed it. Um, we talked about that in the, in the devotion this morning. The Bible teaches us what's right, what's wrong, how to make it right, and how to keep it right. Okay, it teaches us salvation. Um, when Paul goes through in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the last days, the perilous times, and he gives all these characteristics that we can obviously see. If you turn on a TV, if you turn on social media, you can see all of these things that he described uh, as the last days and perilous times. Then he said to Timothy, you've fully known my doctrine. That's most important what we believe, but not just my doctrine. You've seen, you know my manner of life and my purpose. You've seen that how I believe has affected how I walk. Okay, this is very important. And then Paul makes it clear again, and Scripture makes it clear several times, that nothing ever occurred to God. Think about it. You understand the, the, the term, it occurred to me? Which means you just had a random thought. God has no random thoughts. We just talked about the fact that creation is in Genesis chapter 1. And yet in John chapter 1, Christ is said to have been before creation. And uh, creation is... Most theologians believe somewhere four to five thousand years uh, before, um, or th we'll say three to five thousand years before Bethlehem. Revelation was written about AD 95, between AD 95 and AD 100. So again, about 1900 years ago. No calendar is exactly right. So we're going to just round it off at 1900. The book of Revelation near the end describes Christ as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we look at all this stuff. And we, I was talking with another missionary last night and he was sharing with me some, some conspiracy theories that he'd heard. And, and like myself, he's not afraid, but he's concerned about what could happen in the next six months. All right. Nothing occurred to God. When God used Paul to describe these days that we're living in, he closes out that section with evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and been assured of. What have we learned and been assured of? The word of God. He says, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. So it teaches us how to be saved. If we listen to the world, they give you 40 million things as to what will make you a better person or, or save you eternally if they believe in eternal life. But the Scriptures make it clear Jesus is the only solution to that problem, right? The greatest problem is sin. The only solution is Jesus. And then he says, all Scripture, what you said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's inspired. God breathed it. And it's profitable for doctrine. That's what's right. For reproof. That's what's wrong. For correction. How to make it right. And instruction in righteousness. How to keep it right. So that the man or woman of God may be perfect. That doesn't mean without flaw, without sin. That means complete. Truly furnished unto all good works. This is a book of prophecy, and when you read through it, we, we talk about what the world has to say about it, and, and Brandy said crazy, and I saw a little meme yesterday that a preacher friend of mine posted, and this is what the, this is what, tell, tell me something unbelievable that you know is in 
Revelation. It's in the book of Revelation. Tell me something that, that's some some description that you find. Oh man, that's just outlandish. Brandy? A creature with multiple heads. Okay. Somebody else? A worldwide earthquake. Okay. Anybody else? A river turning into blood. Um, that's why the two witnesses, a lot of people believe that's Moses and Elijah because the miracles that God allows those two witnesses to perform are the same ones that Elijah and Moses performed. Very good. You have this monster that, that Brandy talked about. So the Bible begins with a talking snake and ends with a, a monster You can see why an unbeliever would find the Bible hard to believe. But what is the solution for this? What is the solution for all this is introduction? I promise we're fixing to read Revelations chapter 1 and just kind of get into the... We won't be able to cover it all because I've talked too much in the introduction. But it's all good. We need to know these things. Why, why does the Bible make it clear that a lost person will find the Word of God to be bizarre? How does that happen? We preached about it a few few months ago. That's right, because the thing that's in, in 1 Corinthians 2, I think, uh, the things of the Lord are spiritually discerned. So that person who doesn't know Christ, they can't understand. Or you and I may find parts of the Bible hard to discern, hard to understand, even when we have the Holy Spirit, because it's hard for us to, to wrap our minds around some of these things. But for that lost person... It's hard for them to get past the talking snake and the monster in Revelation until they believe Jesus loves me. I'm a sinner. Sin has a salary I can never pay. Christ died for us. And they call on that Christ. Until they do that, they're not going to understand it. Okay? It is a book of prophecy this first chapter introduces uh, the book and gives us some, some essential information for understanding it. So let's read the first chapter. It is, in my Bible, it's all but a couple of lines on the same page, so hopefully you won't have to turn. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you. And peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him, to Jesus Christ, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha. Notice it's turned to red. These are the words of Christ speaking. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm going to take just a second. Compare Patmos to something in American history. 
What is Patmos? Perfect. It is like Alcatraz. It was an island. So when they exiled him there, he was probably not the only one there. This was like a prison for them. And he was there. Look, he tells you why he's there. He's there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, in a moment, we will get into exactly what uh, Caesar was there. Domitian is the name that he's most known by. But Domitian is one of the first ones who demanded that he be not only uh, seen as emperor of Rome, but worshiped as Lord and Savior. And anybody who wouldn't do that, which would be Christians, were persecuted. Uh, we know that John was sent to prison. Jerome, uh, who was a, uh, we call him a church father from the first, uh, the second century, he would have lived, uh, he, he would have lived, been, been born about the time John died. And then uh, Tertullian, no, I'm sorry, Tertullian was uh, in the second century. In other words, he lived, uh, he was probably converted to Christ at about 113. And so it's possible that he was alive when John was alive. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but Tertullian wrote, and Jerome in the next century, another church father also wrote uh, something that the Bible does not give us, but history, we say, or tradition says that not only had John been, been um, exiled before he was exiled because they had put him in boiling oil and somehow, by the grace of God, he came out practically unscathed. And so since they couldn't kill him, they exiled him to Patmos. All right, let's pick up with verse 10. I was in the Spirit. Again, this is John talking. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man. Notice the Son is capitalized. It's talking about Christ. He was clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. In other words, he had some kind of golden breastplate on his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That would be the word of God, right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 17. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Uh, <clears throat> And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which, which thou sawest are the seven churches. All right, just one little more rabbit trail before I continue my introduction while I can. I have about 10 minutes left I can use. Uh, the word angel there in chapter 20. Let me get there quickly. Give me just a, a millisecond. In verse 20, pardon me, I said chapter 20. It means a messenger. It is almost, the, the Greek word is almost the same as the English word angels. 
But we're not talking about um, we're not talking about what we envision. When we describe Tim and an angel as we so often envision them, how would you describe an angel like we typically see them in our minds? Exactly. They usually got a flowing white garment, big, huge white wings and stuff. By implication here, everyone I've ever read after believes these angels are the pastors of those churches. Okay? That'll be important as we get into the letters. But uh, this title, Revelation, is actually where um, we get our English word apocalypse. But what we use the word apocalypse to mean is not what this word means. When we think of apocalypse, what do we think of? What did you say? Chaos. Okay, what did you say? Somebody behind you said something? I didn't catch you. War torn? Is that what you said? Yeah, I mean, I think of Mad Max, right? Anybody? I mean, I'm the old one in the room, but Mad Max was, uh, well, I guess Werner's actually older than me, but... Uh, Mad Max with uh, Mel Gibson, you know, it was just craziness, right? Um, that's not what the word means. The word actually means an unveiling. It means a revealing, all right? So what's being revealed here? Um, John, if you think of Daniel's, Daniel and Revelation kind of go hand in hand, right? But what was Daniel told to do with his prophecy? You just studied Daniel. What, is, what was Daniel told to do with his prophecy? Oh, no, he was told to shut it up, shut up the words and seal them in the book. Daniel chapter 12, verse four, shut up the words, seal them. John is told to uh, seal not. Look in, look in Revelation 22, 10. Look, at, look in Revelation 22, 10. I'll give you a second to get there. He is specifically commanded opposite of what God commanded Daniel. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Since Calvary, since the resurrection, since the coming of the Holy Spirit, God has ushered in the last days. So everyone who has lived has accurately thought that they were living in the last days because they are, okay? The church age is or consists of the last days. Look in Hebrews chapter 1 with me, with me real quick. Oh, I went too far. Then I went too far that way. I hope you love it when you do that. Hebrews chapter 1. Everybody there? Verse 1, God, who at sundry times, what does sundry mean? Different times. That's exactly right, Joe. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. We're not going to continue reading there, but... The last days, and he is fulfilling hidden purposes, hidden purposes in the in the world. This book begins and ends with the phrase, "The time is at hand." We read it in verse three, then we read it in in twenty two. Uh, John's prophecy is primarily, as I said, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's not necessarily the revelation of future events. Because we cannot divorce the person of Christ from the prophecy. They go hand in hand. This is very important. And that's why so many of us say it would have been better named with the first phrase of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ is not incidental to the actions of revelation. He is the chief subject of revelation. Just like he is. I, I think, you know, when, when we have gone through on Tuesday training, we've gone through uh, all of the New Testament and, and we're through, we'll be in Amos this week. Um, and every book we've covered, we've given it a key verse. 
What do you think is the key verse that are the key verses of the whole Bible? If you had to right now on the spot choose verses that you would say these verses, this one verse, these two verses, they give us the, the, the subject matter of the whole Bible, what would you say? Tim, you look like you're itching to say something. John you know, I figured somebody would say John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? Brandy, what were you going to say? Revelation 1, 8. Revelation 1, 8. Okay. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end, which was, which is, and which is to come, the Almighty. All right. Anybody else? Jesus Christ. Just those two words. Okay. Fred? The kingdom of God is at hand. Okay. He starts the book of Mark with that. That's his first sermon. Repent and believe the gospel. Gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus Christ, John 3 16. I'm the Alpha and Omega. Jeremy, you got something? I'm looking up to see what verse it was. It was uh, uh, Christ died for us. Uh, that's Romans 5 8. Christ died for us. All of these are very good. I do have a different one. Uh, Denise has gotten closest to what I think it is, but everybody has struck on something that could be called the central theme of the Scriptures. Janet, do you have something? No. Well, I think that um, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, I think are the verses. Let me flip over there. Uh, would be the key verses of the, the whole Bible. And, it, and I think you'll see when I read them that it actually goes with everything every one of you said in some way or another. We'll start in verse 9. That's where the sentence starts. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven already saved, things in earth 50-50 shot. Things under the earth, no chance. Burning in hell for eternity. And that every tongue, that includes those who are in hell, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I, I think that's the key. So again, he is, not, he is not incidental to the story. He is the... Uh, he is the story, right? In, in Revelations 4 and 5, we see Christ, or we will see Christ as the glorified Lamb of God reigning on His throne. In Revelation 6 to 18, we will see Christ as the judge of all the earth. And then in Revelations 19, He's returning to earth with the church on the white horses, etc., to set up His thousand-year reign. Um, I'm going to have to come in for a landing here and just, it's 45. i got to stop right there. I should, but I'm going to go a minute longer. Tell me, we know that Christ wrote the Bible. We know that God is responsible for the Bible. But when we think of the Apostle John, tell me what he wrote in the Bible. Quickly. He wrote the Gospel of John. First, second, third John, and Revelation. So in all of those, you kind of have a different, a different purpose. In the Gospel of John, as I told you earlier, the purpose is to believe. In the epistles, if you think of 1 John 5, 13, these th so many people doubt their salvation. So many people struggle with with trusting that they're saved and you see people who want to get saved over and over and over and over and over and over and again first john five thirteen. these things have i written on you unto you that believe that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe okay in other words um i didn't quote that exactly it says believe on the son of god i believe but i can tell you exactly what it says first john there's three there's five there's 13 these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, it teaches that we can be sure and we can continue to believe. Okay? And then when we look at Revelation, even so come quickly. So it's believe, be sure, and be ready. Because he could come today. 
Right, Joe? Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for those that have gathered out for Sunday school. We pray you would just take this a simple introduction, uh, though it was very wide. Um, and it was only an inch deep, Lord. But I pray you take this simple introduction and encourage us with you are in charge. And you are coming again soon, Lord. And help us to live every day knowing that today could be the day. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.